Yeah. Welcome back. It's still the run-up, and uh, like we promised, we're going to be talking education today. And we have on standby a retired director, Quality Assurance, in the Cross River State Minister of Education, and who is presently uh, the chairman of Diocesan Education Board, Catholic Diocese of Ogoja. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Nandi Peter Bete. Thank you so very much for having me. Okay, uh, we, we're glad that at least you have experienced uh, both sectors. Uh, both, uh, uh, you've had the experience in both uh, places, uh, public and private. Now you're in the private, you were in the public first as quality assurance. Let's try to get a comparison between uh, these two, the uh, public sector and the private sector as it concerns education, in your experience, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, from my background, I was brought up with a mission school. We went to primary school, secondary schools, when the missionaries were in charge. And then we went on to tertiary education and came back to work in the public sector at the time that the uh, government had taken over the running of schools. Remember Decree 1 of uh, 1971, which took over all voluntary agency schools. So, government now put in place structures to run education. Uh, as somebody who worked there for so many years and in my managerial position, I'll be bold to say that um, uh, the biggest problem in the public education sector is uh, improper funding, lack of adequate funding. And where there are no funds, so many things cannot be done. I ended up in the quality assurance unit, and the experience showed that uh, when schools are not funded, when the system is not funded, teachers are not well paid, most of them are not paid on time. Teachers are promoted. Promotions are not implemented. Teachers die. The system does not show any concern for a dead worker. Not to talk of the family left behind. So the morale is low. And uh, you send out quality assurance officers to ensure that the system is in order. But the logistics is not in place. They don't have means of movement. They don't have other instruments like ability to sanction where people are erring. So this attributes to the very poor standard that we have in public schools. Now when we talk of funding, it's not as if the mission schools or the private sector as it were now are more funded or, or are, are better funded. But the dedication of the teachers goes a long way in ensuring that things are in order. Uh, teachers are dedicated because instead of the teachers that is paid to them, they realize that their welfare is uppermost in the minds of their managers. And when there is supervision, so many things go the right way. Like I said, in the public sector, you have quality assurance officers that are supposed to check standards, are supposed to supervise, are supposed to inspect. But they are not regular on the field because the logistics is lacking. And once there is no supervision, <laughs> things don't go the proper way. Then I talk about sanction. In cross river state, teachers' wages, teacher salaries are computerized. And at the end of the month, the teacher gets alert in the bank. Whether such a person has been in school or not, 
the editor of the principal may only query, and the query will get to a certain place, and he probably yeah, there will be no effect. But at the end of the month, what the person is paid. In the private sector, on the other hand, the teachers are aware that if you err, you are tampering with whatever the teaching you are supposed to collect at the end of the month. So there is that education. I don't let me stop there and ask so, I'm so for your next question. I don't know so, whether <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're 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 doing well. So the major problem in public education is supervision, as you said, and yes, funding. Yes, yes. Okay. But it seems as if there's more money in the public sector because uh, um, teachers in the public sector are more well paid and they, they should be some kind of insurance that they are being given and some other incentives. So why are you now saying that it is better in the private sector when all these things are there? Now, in the public sector, I tell you that the sanction, the you know, the fear of the unknown is not there. Nobody tampers with their income at the end of it all, except when there is an extreme case that somebody is either terminated or whatever. And then, because there is no supervision. There is this like a cal attitude to work. Now let us go back to the military era. I told you the military government took over schools, if we all know. And then in 1979 introduced free education. Prior to this, they realized that they had to train teachers that will take care of the free education program. So there was this thing they called crash program in teacher training where everybody abandoned his first calling, tailors, readers, and ran to the teacher training colleges because they were paying allowances and they were sure that they were going to be employed at the end of it all. So these people are in the field and they have not divorced themselves completely from their first calling because they know that even as the payment in the teaching fee is regular, it's not as attractive as in the other public service, in the civil service. So they make up with whatever they can do as extra, ex extra job, which is their first calling. So the dedication to teaching is not there. I did youth service in Sokoto State in those days, and I was teaching in a teacher training college, government teachers college, Bini Yaoli, where unfortunately they went and adopted children last year, now in federal government college. Now, my final year students, I was teaching them English. They told me that whether they pass the two or not, man must work that they must be employed. So they were sure that money is waiting for them, the teacher is waiting for them at the end of their training, even that they were doing free. So what I'm talking about is dedication, passion. Teaching is an inborn something. Now, most of the people that are in the employ of the private schools, especially the mission you know, institutions, they know that the salary is not attractive. I go around, I ask them, why do you choose to teach? They say it is their love for children, their passion for teaching. So when you see teaching as your first love, you will give in everything you have for it, not for the pecuniary games. Let's talk about the curriculum now. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations, you know, from several quarters saying that the curriculum needs to be changed. And, you know, conversations have come up on social media and even on the mainstream media, people saying that children of today are being uh, taught with the same curriculum that has been on for decades. Uh, do, you, do you agree with this school of thought that, you know, the curriculum needs to be improved or changed? 
give an answer and question very well. We're talking about the forest gate, the curriculum. Yes. There are so many things wrong with the Nigerian school curriculum today. The National Education Research and Development Council has been tampering and toying with the curriculum. You can imagine that they are not here, they want to reintroduce his history. They want to tap down the curriculum and remove so many things that are supposed to build up the character of a child. During the missionary days, moral instruction was a mandatory subject. But after 1971, it was no longer that they started different names. They said they should not teach Bible, they shouldn't teach Quran and all that one. The missionary they said they spread fears that time I read a book where a missionary predicted that a lack of moral instruction in schools was going to tell on the Nigerian society in future. And we are seeing it now. Virtually every social problem we have now has roots in the poor educational foundation that we have. So the curriculum, I don't know how many subjects they are teaching now. There are so many subjects. If we could revert to the curriculum we had before now, where you have core subject areas like arithmetic, like physics, like health science, and all that. I know they have introduced Computer education is a dynamic field. But I think that for the curriculum, they are giving the children too much to bite. There are so many, too many subjects. I don't know whether I have answered the okay. question. These too many subjects, are they relevant at all? Or do you propose that they be merged, some of them be merged together? They should be merged. Hmm. They should be merged. Okay, away from the curriculum now, um, most of the things that succeed, if not all of them, depend on the manpower, depend on the people who are running them. And we're, we're looking at teachers uh, running schools, teaching the children in schools. Um, the mode of, let's say, recruitment now for the teachers, is, is there a better way that that, that that can be done because we've been talking about mode of recruitment even for the police and armed forces and everybody because they have critical roles to play in the society. But for any society to grow, someone or the people in that society need to be taught. So is there a particular thing we're missing in the recruitment of teachers, for instance, in a Nigerian educational system? Thank you. No educational system rises above the level of the teachers. No country rises above the level of our education. There is a social problem that needs to be corrected. Teaching is not supposed to be an all commerce field. Let's go down to where people are recruited into studying education. They lower the standards for people going into college and education, going to read education. Only the best brace to go into teaching. And they can only be at attracted where the conditions are attractive. Now, the government, there are governments across Nigeria, not particularly across the United States, have not been serious with education, especially in the area of teacher recruitment. In controversy, for instance, over the years, so many teachers have retired, many have died. But the recruitment process has been very slow. People who really need education are favored over those who even have professional education because of man, no man. But even then, the classrooms are virtually empty because there is no, there is no employment. Now, if we were to rectify things, 
the teaching sector, the educational sector, I put right, teaching. The school should be appropriately taught with qualified teachers. There are many people that read education that are qualified, they are looking for teachers, they don't get them. You go to a secondary school in a community, the tell you this community secondary school is run by the government. The only teachers you have there are the principal, vice principal, and maybe one teacher. They don't even have to go to the extra length of recruiting what they call parent teacher association teachers to uh, handle other lessons. So, in the area of staffing, it has been very, very lacking in the government sector. Mr. Bertrand, just, just, just a moment. Just a moment, Mr. Bertrand. We ensure that we have enough teachers to take care of people. Okay. In fact, the people uh, teacher, which we most of our North East Primary School, are even in some cases, not more than one teacher to 25 people. Most of them are less than that. But in the public schools, you will see one teacher in Indian language for a school that has JSS1 to SST. One teacher in mathematics. There is no science. SST. There could be a science teacher that is on part time because he teaches in so many other places. So the staffing has been a problem and it contributes to low standards. Okay. It is still the run up, and we're still looking at the uh, ills in the education sector here in Nigeria. And we've been talking to Mr. Nandi Bete. He's the chairman of the Season Education Board, Castle Diocese of Ogoja. Uh, Welcome back to the program. Are you still there? Can you hear me? Thank you very much. I'm here. All right. Uh, you, we're looking at the solutions and what we can do better to make the education you know, sector grow. And you've mentioned a lot of differences between the private and public sectors as, as regards to education. But I want to ask you this. Aside from... Everything else that is expected of the government, you know, to put in place uh, when it comes to the education sector to make it better. Are there things or activities that you think schools can do on their own at an independent level to also make themselves better? Yes. I have said, I said from the beginning that poor funding is actually key in education. If you go around the public schools, the infrastructure is appalling. There are no seats. The floors are not like that. Teachers are not there. So the public schools now have been left there for pupils from indigent homes. The private schools are in a sort of competition among themselves. So the, their infrastructure is being worked on every now and then. And those parents that have a little means take their children to private schools, locally here. At the national level, they take them out. You can imagine that the, our children need to go to school in the Republic. There is a problem here. We have to be solved. We are not dedicated. To, we are not committed to uplifting public, ed, you know, education. I'm talking about the basic new level now because where the foundation is not there, whatever you build on top is faulty. Government needs to be serious. In fact, they should declare a state of emergency on public education, especially at the basic level. All the millions they read in basic education, they do not trickle down. You need to go around the rural areas and see the type of schools that are existing there. The teachers are not motivated. The environment is not conducive. Teaching and learning do not go on well. So government needs to pay more attention to public education. Declare a state of emergency and be serious about funding education. 
That's the first step. The first step towards finding a solution to the entire problem. Just a moment, Mr. Better. Um, yes. we, we know that the government may be failing in its responsibility, but the question now is, in a case where the government is not doing what they're supposed to do, what can the schools themselves do to make sure they sustain themselves and also the quality improves so much so that uh, it doesn't have to be a school for indigent uh, students like you, you, you said yourself? What can the schools internally do to maintain a certain amount of quality and have people come into the school? Now, I tell you, let me, let me just give you an instance. There is a community around my area. The only government presence in that community is the public primary school. The buildings were crumbling. Everything. So the community now have to put money together to erect structures. After the innovation, they realized that the teachers were not there, only the head teacher and two others. They are not paying for teachers that they have recruited to teach because not all parents have the means to take their children to the urban centers or to put their children in private institutions. So the school, when you talk of the school, they are talking of the community that owns that school. In the situation where people pay taxes and they still go out to provide social amenities for themselves, there is a problem. Government has to look seriously into funding of education and properly channeling these funds to where they are supposed to go. Okay, um, let's, let's just look the other way. Uh, this is 2023 and there's going to be an election. Uh, very soon. On the 25th, there's going to be presidential election, 25th of uh, February. Um, if the, ch the new president comes in and he has to do some reforms in education, where and where do you think he needs to start from? Putting in place the things that will be instrumental to uh, a revamp in the educational sector going forward. Thank you. There is a Chinese proverb. That says, if you miss your way a thousand miles, you retrace your test a thousand miles and start again. We have to go back to the drawing board. A new president coming to the Nigeria has a lot of job on his hands. For so education, they have to go back and look at what the early missionaries did because they brought the education to us. What did the early missionaries do that gave us concrete standard education? Our parents, most of them, didn't even finish primary six. But they could read and write. My bishop, Bishop uh, Edelard Pan of Catholic Diocese of Oguja, set up the Diocese and Education Board because his passion is to return education to where the early missionaries left it. And I uh, must be proud to say that the results are coming for everybody to see around here. The new president in this country must bring in people that have passion for education. Sit down on the round table with him and discuss with him and tell him where and where things are going on so that they could be rectified from the foundation. The road we are seeing in uh, tertiary institutions. It started from the foundation. Hello. Yeah, we can we can still hear you. Yeah, it started from the foundation. And if we must return education the way it was, there is tank I want they call it a nation my practice. It has to be tackled head wrong. I understand there are laws. There are laws. If you do this, you will be in prison. But for all the life, all the time I work in the public sector, I did not hear that somebody was convicted for examination mal uh, practice. There was a time I went into a school 
when the wired examinations were going on and they were writing English language, the fellow ascended to go and monitor the exams, told me he was sick. I didn't know he had collected money from the that, that school to allow them to do whatever they wanted to do. I went to the place. I just took a chair and sat down in the examination hall. I didn't know I sat down. You know that there was no there was no exam. No child would write. Because they were expecting that they are going to give them the answers from outside. But as I sat down there, nothing went on. They couldn't write. So there are a lot of issues that have to be tackled to put education back to where it's supposed to be. And the next president of this country has a lot of job in his hands. If he's sincerely wanting to return Nigeria to where we are supposed to be, especially in the education sector. Okay, now that you we have uh, touched on the next president, it's it's um, it's very political, as it were. But there's nothing we can say nowadays that we cannot tie to what policies will be made beyond 2023, and that will be in the hands of the people that we are going to elect. So let's digress a little bit, a little bit, and go into politics. Um, a lot of people have come to the scene to just say a lot of things that they think will happen in 2023, especially in the elections. So as we prepare for the elections, do you think we are ready for this election? And if we're not, what things do you think should be uh, put in place for us to have both free and fair election and, and satisfactory election to all Nigerians and then have the right man in power? You are taking me from education to politics now. Yes. <laughs> you are taking me from education to politics. Yes, because everything is related nowadays. What Nigeria needs now, they don't even need much. They are seeing the pains. Everybody is in pains. All they need to be told and to be sensitized is not to sell their goods not to sell their goods and to cast their vote for those they think are going to help them out of the present situation. I was in the village the other day and uh, my uncles came and they said, what do we do in this election? I said, you yeah, asked me what you should do. What do we buy for five naira? You are now buying for 30 naira. And these people will say they were coming to make life good for you. If you want them to, con to continue, you use your head. People in Nigeria should be sensitized. They should be, they should know that this country has money. And that if you be properly deployed, life will be good. Okay, let me, we are talking politics. Where I come from in Bukhi, they have devastated the forest. They have devastated the forest. They are logging. But there are some communities, like my own community, you don't enter. You don't enter our, our forest. So if people could be sensitized to know that destroying the environment is wrong, they could also be sensitized to know that to vote wrongly is a wrong, is a wrong way to go. Okay. All right. Uh, we're still talking politics now. And like Nyango said, everything is intertwined. Do you think that the you know, religious organizations have a role to play in the forthcoming elections? And if you think so, what do you think those roles are? <sighs> they keep telling us that uh, we should not consider religion when it comes to politics. But events in the past couple of years have shown us that politics is a key factor in Nigerian politics. It is wrong to tell people that politics shouldn't matter, that it is just that that is religion should be you no know, it shouldn't matter. Religion should matter. People that 
have conscience that said God religiously should be bold enough to enter politics and practice what they learn in their churches so that the society will be better for us. We have had a lot of problems. Right now they are talking about Muslim Muslim ticket, Christian Christian ticket, the northern you know perpetration in the power and order. Every sensible Nigerian should be reminded that there are so many things that are holding us together. And I will have to look at those things that hold us together and avoid those things that will cause us to fall away from each other. For me, the religious sensitivities of individuals of various groups should not be assaulted. We should tread with caution, with care, and balance equations religiously as far as politics in Nigeria is concerned. Okay. Uh, well, uh, sorry, Mr. Better, that we took you from education to politics, but we had to just chip yeah. that in because we know that you are, even though not officially designated, an activist for good governance. And we've been following you for some time now and know what you, your feelings are. We'd like to thank you for coming on the show this morning to give us your experience and your perspective on the education system in Niger. Thank you so very much for having me. Bless you. Okay, we've been talking to Mr. Nandi Peter Bete, who is uh, the chairman of education board of the Catholic, Archdioc Catholic Diocese of Ogoja, St. Benedict's Catholic Diocese of Ogoja. He's also, he was also a member of the Ministry of Education board. He was in charge, the chairman of the Quality Assurance in the um, Cross River State Ministry of Education. We will take a break now and go for the news. After that, we'll wrap up the show. Stay with us.